Sri Lanka is in an unprecedented economic crisis, um, a crisis that is going to uh, take quite a long, uh, quite a long while to uh, resolve itself. Um, there will have to be um, serious uh, remedial measures that have to be taken. But we must also remember that the economic crisis has an institutional dimension. We got to where we are because of a particular decision-making model that we have in our political and constitutional system. And that model is one that concentrates power uh, almost entirely in the hands of one person, and that is the executive presidential system. The current president, when he was elected in 2019, uh, made a very explicit claim that the recentralization of political power, of executive power, uh, in the uh, executive presidency and the weakening of checks and balances on that office through parliament, through the courts, and especially through the independent institutions, the independent commissions, <clears throat> was not a good idea because the program of development and growth that he wanted to implement required him to act uh, in an unfettered way. And hence, that is the reason why uh, his government in 2020 passed the 20th amendment to the constitution uh, which recentralized power in the executive presidency and weakened checks and balances now it is as a result of the lack of checks and balances the lack of consultation and coordination within the government the fact that everything revolved around the presidency and the the people around him people the officials that he appointed in the treasury in the central bank and so on these are the people who took the catastrophic decisions <clears throat> over the last two, two and a half years that has got us to where we are. So that is the institutional dimension of our economic crisis. That has to be also resolved if we are, as we get out of the economic crisis. So it is not a pure matter of economic, macroeconomic, monetary, fiscal policy <clears throat> and debt policy and so on. It is also a matter of institutional reform. That is the reason why we need to ensure that um, we have a system of government in place that does not lead to decision making, poor decision making of this nature again, uh, so that we don't end up in crisis again. Um, what is needed for that? And we have, of course, before we even uh, reached uh, this, this state, uh, which is unprecedented, we had known for 45 years now that the executive presidential system <clears throat> does create and has the tendency to create these problems, even though we had not got to this kind of situation before so the argument had been made that this centralization of political power and the lack of checks and balances uh, is a terrible thing in fact not only because of the potential for rights violations and the uh, violations of the rule of law uh, and the lack of democracy but it's just not uh, an, a good economic model of decision making uh, even though the proponents of presidentialism argue that that is its strength we have known in the sri lankan uh, context and in our experience that exec executive presidentialism is a terrible idea so it has to go it is the one single most important reform that is needed to ensure that our uh, constitutional democracy returns to an equilibrium uh, and, a, and, and a system of government that is efficient and transparent uh, and delivers uh, at the same time as it is democratic so the abolition of the executive presidential system is the single most important thing that we have to do, even though there are many others. Last morning, uh, Thursday, the 21st of April, um, the main opposition party in parliament, the SJB, the Assembly, Jala Balavege, uh, its General Secretary Ranjit Madhubandara handed over to the Speaker and the Secretary General of Parliament a private member's bill. Uh, it is called the 21st Amendment to the Constitution Bill. Um, the 21st Amendment to the Constitution Bill has a number of, now it is in the public domain, it's circulating around, uh, you can find it. Um, <clears throat> there is a number of things that the uh, uh, 21st Amendment uh, to the Constitution Bill seeks to do, and it's important to understand what they are. First and foremost is that it seeks to abolish the executive presidential system, 
introduce a system of checks and balances and constitutional democracy and separation of powers back to our constitutional architecture. Uh, it uh, returns us to a model of parliamentary democracy. That means the executive power is exercised not by a dictatorial president, but by uh, the prime minister and the cabinet. Uh, and the cabinet and the prime minister are answerable and responsible to parliament. The prime minister and the cabinet are chosen uh, from parliament um, on the basis of the, those who have confidence of parliament. And they, uh, when, the, when the moment that they lose confidence of parliament, the government is dismissed. The president in this scheme uh, is a ceremonial or titular president. He will he or she will continue to be called the president of the republic, and he or she will be the head of state and the commander in, commander in chief and all of the ceremonial titles that come with being a head of state. <clears throat> uh, the the uh, a ceremonial president is meant to act. In exactly in a ceremonial way, to represent the state, uh, to be the embodiment of national unity, and so on, but not take part in the active day-to-day -day running of the government, of making policy or implementing. There may be certain roles sometimes where the president has to involve him or herself um, in informal duties to do with the executive, but they are entirely formal and ceremonial. So executive power then will be uh, exercise not by one person but by a group of people collectively responsible cabinet of ministers headed by the prime minister who will be the head of government head of the cabinet and the head of the government <clears throat> the prime minister can only and the, and the ministers can only hold office so long as they enjoy the confidence of parliament the moment that there is a no confidence motion uh, or loses the parliament, withdraws confidence from uh, the executive, the executive ceases to be. That's a much more accountable way of establishing executive power uh, in a country. Uh, such an executive has all the power it needs um, to coherently ar articulate policy and implement policy as a government. There is no problem with that. Some of the best run countries in the world are parliamentary democracies from Singapore to UK to name two very different models of parliamentary government. Um, they have all of the leeway, the discretion that is needed to take tough decisions, um, to respond to crisis and do all of those things. But they have to do so on the basis of answerability, answerability to parliament uh, and to retain the confidence of parliament. So on a daily basis, ministers have to account to parliament for what they do. Unlike a president, president who sits in the presidential secretariat or the president's house or wherever he might be, um, and Parliament um, has no control over that person and the, all the unelected uh, group of officials around that person. Uh, a parliamentary system of government means that the Prime Minister has to answer questions. All ministers have to answer questions. If the ministers and the Prime Minister's performance is unsatisfactory, Parliament can immediately um, pass no, con no confidence uh, and either uh, cause the resignation of an individual minister or cause the resignation of the entire government uh, if the confidence is withdrawn from the prime minister. So that is the executive system that we will have, a parliamentary democratic system, uh, if the 21st Amendment Bill is passed. The 21st Amendment Bill also <clears throat> re-establishes the framework for depoliticized government, um, governance that we had uh, under the 17th Amendment, under the 19th Amendment, all taken away by the 18th and the 20th Amendments, both amendments that were pa passed by different Rajpaksa presidencies. Now we will bring that framework back. What that does is this. There will be a constitutional council, which is presided over by the speaker, uh, and there will be uh, ex officio members like the Prime Minister and the Leader of uh, Opposition uh, in it, uh, plus a number of independent others. And this Constitutional Council will have two functions. One is to recommend uh, appointments uh, to the independent commission. So, the Independent uh, Service Commission, Judicial Services Commission, the Bribery Commission all of these um, independent uh, institutions um, that function independently of the political executive. That is why they are called depoliticized uh, institutions. And they ensure that 
um, or across these uh, services that the state has to provide uh, uh, as governance to the citizens, that they are done in an efficient, transparent, and importantly, non-corrupt and impartial manner, not in a favorite way, a favoritist way. So these independent commissions will be appointed by the Constitution or Council um, on this basis. The other thing that the Constitution or Council uh, seeks to do is this, uh, and that is that the President can make um, formally uh, certain appointments he has to make, uh, such as uh, the service commanders, the IGP, the Attorney General, um, the Governor of the Central Bank under the 21st Amendment, and so on. Um, those no nominations to those offices will be formally made by the President and then appointed only on the approval of the Constitutional Council. So that way also, um, all of these very important um, state, key state officers, like the, uh, the Attorney General, the Auditor General, the Inspector General of Police and so on, uh, judges, um, all of them will be also only be appointed upon the approval of the Constitutional Council. In both these ways then, the Constitutional Council system uh, will ensure that governance becomes far more depoliticized and far more efficient and professional and independent. And this is also a very important dimension of the uh, framework introduced by the, or proposed by the 21st Amendment. Uh, so as we, if the 21st Amendment bill is passed, um, we have uh, a complete change uh, happening in the system of government from a presidential system to a parliamentary system. And now parliament becomes the central institutional forum or for the conduct of national politics. It becomes a far more important institution than the subordinated thing that it has been uh, uh, under the presidential constitution uh, when the almighty president was the most important uh, person in politics. Now parliament as a whole uh, becomes a very, very important place where the representatives of the elected representatives of the people have an opportunity to, uh, to hold the executive to account on a daily and hourly basis. Now, some people are skeptical because for 45 years or so, and in many people's living memory, we haven't seen parliament performing particularly well. We think that it is a den of 225 thieves um, who just go there to sleep um, or shout at each other and then have a subsidized lunch and go home. And parliament has generally a, a very bad reputation. I admit that. But remember, the reason for that is because parliament for 45 years, since 1978, has not been an important place. That is the reason why, except for patronage allocation and, uh, and for 225 people to go and make deals and um, enrich themselves, it has not, not been, generally speaking, not doing its job very well, although there are very honorable exemptions, uh, individuals to this throughout our history. And in the 20, uh, 2015 to 2019 period, um, under the, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was operated, the Parliament became much more important. There was a great speaker, Mr. Karuja Surya. Um, its committee system was entirely um, sort of uh, overhauled. Parliament became much more important, served its purpose as the nation's committee of grievances and its Congress of Opinions, uh, and, that, and doing its job in both effective lawmaking, uh, taking its lawmaking role seriously, and even more so its role of scrutiny of the executive uh, seriously. So when we have a new system like the one that we uh, hopefully will have if the 21st Amendment is passed, a parliament becomes a very, very important place uh, where MPs, uh, can will not be able to exist in the way that we think of MPs. Um, they will have to take their job much more seriously, uh, go there, be there, work in committees, ask questions, participate. Um, the government will constantly be there having to justify them uh, themselves and their actions. Um, many of you may have seen uh, on TV or on the internet uh, how, for example, the drama happens around the prime minister's questions in the House of Commons in the United Kingdom. That's the kind of thing that we will return to, where no, no chief executive, no prime minister uh, is too grand um, to not come and not be almost humiliated 
uh, on a weekly basis. Um, and that is an important thing. It's a performative drama of accountability of parliamentary democracy in action. And that is what we want to see our parliament returning to. It was once like this under the Solberry Constitution and the uh, and First Republican Constitution between 1948 and 1978, um, when we were a parliamentary country, parliament did perform its role fairly well. It was because parliament was performing its role, fa fa role fairly well that somebody like J.R. Jayawardenham, with his sort of fairly dictatorial tendencies, introduced a presidential system so that he will escape that daily accountability uh, and be able to run the run government uh, as a kind of grand um, almost a republican monarch um, we are not going to have that we have seen the disaster that that kind of model of government visits upon our country uh, and that is why we are going to ensure that a parliamentary uh, executive and a parliamentary democracy is going to be reinstated Well, that is a very difficult question to answer at the moment. Now, it has been presented as a private member's bill, and uh, there's a understanding orders, there's a procedure for that. That takes quite a long time and all of that. But there's also the opportunity for Parliament to suspend the standing orders and, and take decisions. Uh, I'm not going to go into um, the sort of very nerdy detail of uh, the rules of parliamentary procedure here, uh, but generally just say this, which is that um, it all depends on the politics. We all know that the, this parliament, <clears throat> um, uh, in terms of the representation of parties, is highly problematic in terms of building a majority. Uh, now that the, uh, in, in 2020, it, the government, uh, the SLPP, the Rajapaksas, had almost a two-thirds majority. That obviously has started disintegrating, as we have seen. Um, and the opposition is fairly weak in terms of numbers and so on. So that is at one level, a problem, because it requires negotiations between parties to very painstakingly construct the majorities that are necessary to pass a constitutional amendment. That is 151 out of 225 are needed, a two thirds majority and the first step to pass a constitutional amendment. Now that's difficult. Uh, no single party uh, has that kind of numbers anymore in our parliament, uh, which then also leads to suspicions that we have uh, because of quite valid um, suspicions that we have uh, in our political culture, that MPs will start prostrating uh, for bribery and corruption and all of that kind of stuff. That danger is there. But unfortunately, those are the conditions in which we have to work. But the really good thing about this is this, which is that when no single party has a, a two-thirds majority, everybody has to come together. And that is almost as if factions of uh, elected opinion uh, from all across this country. These are all people who are elected by us as the people of Sri Lanka. They have to come together to hammer out a consensus and to create a majority that way. Uh, there will have to be certain concessions made and all of that kind of thing that, that is normal in constitutional politics. But in principle, as long as the managers and the sponsors of this bill know what their objectives are, as they are stated in the bill. And if that uh, 150 majority is constructed, then that is the first step. Of course, there is a stage at which the Supreme Court also has an opportunity to pronounce on the constitutionality of this bill. And what the Supreme Court can say is, taking the, the bill as a whole, or certain of its individual provisions, it can say, um, well, it is not sufficient for such and such provisions to be only passed by um, parliament by a two-thirds majority. Um, they are of such a fundamental nature, they're called entrenched provisions, that they will also require, in addition to a two-thirds majority in parliament, the approval of the people at referendum. But it seems to me when I look uh, at the scheme of this 21st Amendment bill, as has been presented yesterday, that the drafters were quite clear that uh, they were not going to avoid the referendum. Um, there are. It's very clear that they have they have said, said certain things, and we are changing the system of government. At the end of the day, we are changing the the fact that the president will no longer be directly elected by the people. The president will be elected by parliament. Uh, the president will become a ceremonial figure. And these are quite fundamental changes to the structure of the 1917 constitution. 
So it seems to be the case that the drafters have clearly contemplated that this requires a referendum. Well, that's a political decision to take, and people will sometimes be a bit critical in the middle of an economic crisis whether this is something we ought to do. Is the cost justified? But I think, on balance, it is a good idea uh, for the uh, for this reason. Uh, for two reasons. One is, uh, of course, the huge benefit, the historic benefit uh, that we will get in changing our system of government. This has been necessary for so very long. Uh, so many pres uh, presidential candidates running for office have promised this and have won on that basis. Very often, both candidates winning the vast majority of votes in presidential elections have promised the abolition of the executive presidential system um, and not done anything about it. Now, we are at a stage where this unprecedented protest movement that we have had in this country, in our country for since 31st of March, has brought the politicians to their knees. And we need to act on this moment. Uh, we need to use the moment uh, to do that, to, to, to make that change. So it is important. If then, therefore, the constitution requires a referendum, then that is justified, even though it looks a little bit uh, um, uh, like a, uh, a difficult thing to do, but it is not. The second reason is uh, the people. It is the people who have um, brought a regime that, that was very authoritarian, had a big mandate, had a big parliamentary majority. It's almost, uh, it's very clear now that the Rajapaksa regime uh, and the two brothers and the, in the two highest offices, the president and the prime minister, however much, whatever that they're doing, is just prolonging the inevitable. It's very clear. There's no chance that once people, uh, 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 democracy certainly, that when uh, the, the president and the prime minister have lost the legitimacy to govern, uh, support authority, absolutely not there, uh, you can't carry on. Uh, so they're just prolonging the inevitable by doing all sorts of very silly things. But I'm convinced that it's only a matter of days before they have to face the inevitable and go. And therefore, we'll have to have this uh, a, 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 a new system um, introduced in short order. Now, for the reason that we don't want the 225 um, to exclusively hammer out deals between themselves, right? The referendum is a great way of ensuring that they are held accountable. They are held accountable. So whatever that is agreed has to come to the people for approval. They know that as they negotiate. Um, and I think this time, um, the deal politics culture uh, of the past, that will, it will not disappear from our culture overnight. Uh, but it will be certainly minimized. There's a lot of scrutiny going on. People are very angry and they are very critical and they're anxious and, and heightened scrutiny on politicians. What they can usually get away with is very difficult to do in these circumstances. So I think in that context also, the fact that the people um, who, who did initiate the political change that we will have uh, will then have a formal say through a referendum uh, in the new constitutional um, framework that we are going to introduce to the president. So in that way also, I think a referendum is justified.